My name is Tristan Roberts, and I've been into DSAG before DSAG was a thing. I was a co-founder for MiniCircle, and now I'm working on advising biotech startups like Lantern Bioworks. This talk seeks to answer one of the questions that might be hanging over this entire uh, movement, which is, can we do something besides just fund new projects? Like, we've proven that that's something that DSI can do, and we can, we can get money someplace, but clearly we're not leveraging the full potential of crypto. And specifically, I'm hoping by the end of this talk, I want you to believe that it's possible to move past the FDA and the patent system uh, through crypto. Uh, I, I don't think I have audio, but the, the summary of this talk is that uh, truth on the internet is hard. There's so much information, and some of it is just straight up intentionally wrong. Some of it you just don't know like, what, what's going on. And now we're going to be increasingly getting slop from the AI bots, and I think DSI is an antidote for that. And uh, moreover, just a way for us to move beyond the paradigm of truth by podcaster, which is the default for when there isn't regulation around something. And so I want to open it up to the uh, audience to answer the question of, how do you know what is true? When you're evaluating something new, what, what is a sign that something might be true? That's great, but most articles haven't been reproduced, and therefore it's hard to, to know. First principles I, is good, but unfortunately most people don't have the cognitive processing to, to do that. But yes, in theory, that, that, that does help. Uh, sort of sanity check. Yeah. Then, the, yes, that helps too, but then you might end up in an echo chamber where, oh, that's too different, and, and therefore... Yes, I, th I think that's a huge concern is that a lot of things are just not falsifiable and then you just, you're stuck because it's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, so, so one of my theses is that scientism has become something of a cult, an ideology filling the vacuum left from when we killed God. During the pandemic, how many times did we hear just trust the science as if science is immutable and perfect rather than messy and iterative? Ultimately, science is just a process. It's a way of coming to know the truth. And unfortunately, science can't be removed from the economic and political forces that fund the research, the interpretation of the research, and the dissemination of those interpretations. So at every, all of those levels, there's ways for bad actors to mess things up. But rather than pretending that these forces are not at play, what if we could harness them for good? And specifically in biomedicine, we see these incentives where these different groups need each other, but they also want to exploit each other. And uh, it takes tens of millions of dollars to legitimize a treatment, and so therefore herbalism, traditional Chinese medicine, longevity drugs, none of these can raise that amount of money, and accordingly, they're not viewed as real by a large chunk of the population. So I guess the challenge of DSI is like, how can we change the incentives so that all of these parties are a little bit more cooperative rather than combative? But first, let's dive into history just a little bit, uh, take a step back. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does often rhyme. I think we're on the cusp of a third scientific revolution. Uh, initially, uh, we had like, the, the church was kind of controlling knowledge. They determined what was preserved and what wasn't, and what was heretical and what wasn't. And ultimately, it became sort of self-serving, right? Heliocentrism was a challenge to the church's power, and therefore, it was pro persecuted. Uh, the first scientific revolution saw non-religious organizations, largely funded by patronage, uh, start to fill in that gap of knowledge. And then Science 2.0 in the 20th century saw funding change to mostly government agencies. But I think, unfortunately, after 100 years, pretty much any institution has gotten corrupted. The people who are sociopathic have learned how to game the system, they've made their way to the top, and now they're just trying to extract as much energy, power, whatever from it as possible. And, and so this quote from President Eisenhower's farewell address sums up the shortcomings of the 20th century science funding paradigm. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by the federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present, and is to be gravely regarded 
is greatly to be regarded. So this talk will be structured uh, in this format, roughly, uh, for people who are more spatially minded. We're going to go through conventional science, mostly looking at the problems of the current paradigm. I'm going to look at how DSI is manifesting right now, and then how I think DSI might manifest once more of the infrastructure is in place. Uh, so presently, uh, with drug discovery, treatment discovery, there's a signal to noise ratio that isn't so great. Everybody wants their idea to be the thing that solves everything, and so that leads to a lot of people claiming things, but not necessarily like it being accurate or realistic. Uh, there's also sort of this problem of the coordination where many ideas just never make it to market. This has been called the biotech valley of death. So as a project goes from idea to preclinical to clinical, there's so many points where it can just fail. Like maybe you can't get the funding, maybe the, you can't get the licensing deal, maybe you can't, like the co-founders like start hating each other. All of these cause like projects that could potentially benefit society to just like drop off and then they never become a thing because it just doesn't get validated. So many of these concepts originate in academia and usually the university owns the intellectual property. And so while the like creator, the originator might want it to actually see, you know, the market, uh, the university is more of like, well, how can we get as much money as possible out of this? And so a lot of deals just never happen because like when the tech transfer office wants 50% of the thing, it's like you're never going to be able to actually raise the money to, to get it to market. And then in private, the private sector, there's a problem where you might find something really interesting in your work, but if it doesn't fit with what your company is, like their, their model is, then it might just get swept under the rug and, and never see the light of day as well. So moving on to evidencing, or how we legitimize a treatment, how we build credibility for it, uh, we're currently facing a replication crisis. In theory, a paper contains enough information for someone else to do the same experiment and probably get the same results. But this is found to be rarely the case. It's worse in some fields than others, but generally it seems like over half of the papers cannot be replicated when another group tries to do the same experiment. And so this is a huge problem because we're like trying to do incremental knowledge building, but if the foundation is, is garbage, then everything else on top of it's probably going to be garbage as well. Uh, Alzheimer's uh, amyloid thesis is perhaps one of the uh, best examples of that recently. This is a problem because like, the unexpected results are what lead to the paradigm shift. So if everyone's trying to get a certain outcome that they already know, then you're not actually doing anything innovative. You're just kind of confirming what you already know, maybe extending it a little bit, but it's really the like, surprising finds that lead to big paradigm shifts in science. Beyond the replication crisis, there's also just a lot of corruption and regulation. The United States is a civilized country, so that means you don't have to bribe the FDA directly. You have to pay a lawyer tens of thousands of dollars, who presumably goes golfing with the FDA regulators, so that way your application actually gets reviewed. If you don't have that lawyer, the FDA assumes you're not serious and that you're wasting their time. Originally, the FDA only evaluated safety, but their mission expanded to include efficacy. This is problematic because some drugs might be pretty good with treating many diseases, but if the drug is not better than the industry standard for a certain disease indication, it probably won't get approved. And when a regulator approves a study and 20 people die during it, it's a tragedy that tarnishes their career. But if a drug that could have saved 20,000 people isn't approved, there's only an invisible graveyard. Nobody knows that that happened, and so generally the, the Regulators err on the side of caution, but that leads to this dynamic where things that could and should be approved don't. And then lastly, uh, the FDA doesn't do an evaluation of supplements, longevity, augmentation, nootropics, these sorts of things. And so it's practically impossible to raise the money to do a phase two or a phase three uh, study. Uh, MAPS is a good example of this, uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. MDMA was patented in the 1930s, and therefore it's, it's long gone, worn off, but uh, I think anyone who's done MDMA knows that there probably is some psychotherapeutic utility, but 
these poor hippies have been having to beg for money for like 30 years, and now they're just like finally getting to the point where like it might get approved. But actually, last week they got shot down two to eight, I think, in a vote. So maybe they'll get more data. Maybe there's just a cabal that doesn't want things like this happening. And then for uh, longevity, recently Loyal, a uh, canine study, uh, is, is, was approved to look at lifespan increases uh, for dogs. So if that ends up being successful, I think there's a chance that we might see lifespan for humans becoming something that's targeted by regulators. This little graphic just kind of sums up the state of affairs, the difference between the scientists that we like revere as saints versus today. Uh, there's this quote, academic politics are so vicious precisely because the stakes are so small. All of the fighting over a limited source of funding has led to something of a hybrid pyramid scheme slash circle jerk. Go against the mainstream consensus and your papers won't get their peer review approved and your funding will dry up. Then you won't get tenure and you'll be destined to die in obscurity. So, distribution. Uh, I think the main problem in the United States is the cost. Because the phase two and phase three studies are so expensive, pharma companies have to charge a ridiculous markup on their product. This gets passed along to the insurance companies and then on to us. Uh, moreover, when these massive insurance companies or single payer nations, they, they start to do a cost benefit to different treatments. And even though something might be better, for your disease, they're like, well, that, go for the cheaper option first, and then if that doesn't work, then we'll pay for the more expensive option. And ultimately, it's, it's just limiting freedom, and so what's the alternative, right? Like, online pharmacies, maybe, uh, but how do you know they're legit? How do you know the purity of the drug? And then one of the other issues is just global approval is practically impossible. Some countries just by default accept what the US has approved, but Europe doesn't do that, China doesn't do that. And so a lot of treatments might get approved in like a few jurisdictions, but almost none get approved in the entire world because it's just not worth it if you're already making bank from uh, some approvals. And then bigger picture, some questions are just unsolvable in science because you're supposed to reach consensus, right? But if a lot of people are making a lot of money from a certain viewpoint, then there's go it's gonna be really hard to reach consensus, right? There's the quote like, you can never convince a person of something when their salary depends on them not knowing that. And uh, so COVID vaccines, like pros and cons, like clearly they're not entirely worthless and clearly they're not entirely good, but like people are usually polarized into one or the other and, and it's, just, it's just awful. Uh, similarly, glyphosate, AKA Roundup, does it cause environmental and health issues? Europe seems to have figured that out, but here in the United States, environmental scientists are, are still promoting it. But when you look at it, that, that company is funding these institutions, these careers, and, and because of that, of course, there's gonna be this like tension. And then if you allow me to put my tinfoil hat on for just a moment, I think there's a chance that the physics model could be better than the standard model, but like A, nobody would have heard of it and nobody would believe it because until you have a consensus shift like it's just gonna be regarded as like a crackpot theory. And so like in the case of Einstein, that, that was true. People thought that his idea of like the curvature of space time was ridiculous, but then there was a observation of light like being curved through gravity and then the papers ran with it and he was regarded as a hero for this new breakthrough. But if there hadn't been that event, there's a chance that the standard, his model would never have been adopted for years and years later. And so I asked the question, like, what happens if advances go against established industries, defense or oil, and if they're shaping the discourse, if they're funding the researchers, it's, very, it's much easier to stop or slow progress than it is to make it, unfortunately. All right, so changing gears, we'll look at the current DSI landscape. Uh, discovery is largely happening in private chats, Discord, Telegram, forums. Uh, DAOs form around interest groups and then people sort of use their reputation to propose a project to a DSI DAO and then hopefully something gets done with it, right? Well, we're still working on that part. But I will say that the shift from public forums to searchable, uh, or from private, oh, sorry, from public forums to private chats has caused a lot of information to just no longer be available 
uh, because it's not being indexed on a search engine. So that's another thing that hopefully will change through DSI. So then when we go to evidencing, right now the model is pretty much the same. Uh, you, you would hire a CRO to run the study, a contract research organization. The only difference being that now you pay them in crypto instead of in USD, but it's not too different. But I would like to give a shout out to DSI Labs that are working on a composable research object, which is kind of a replacement for a DOI. Every paper has a DOI that is kind of like a permanent address. They've released something called a DPID. And beyond just the manuscript, you can also put your data set in there. And you can even put the code that you ran to analyze the data in there. And then you can also have like a versioning history. So that way, there's kind of a place that aggregates all this information together and hopefully increases transparency and, and reproducibility. Uh, distribution, I think there's kind of two approaches for that right now. You can either jump through the hoops or fly under the radar. Don't try to do both. Jumping through the hoops means partnering with Big Pharma to bring the treatment to market. I think VitaDAO is probably going to end up doing that through their partnership to Pfizer and whatnot. I mean, well, let's see. And then uh, the other approach is just don't make any medical claims, right? Like you might hint that this is uh, has a medical benefit, but don't actually say that, and then hopefully the, the FDA doesn't come after you. Uh, HairDAO has launched their first product, which is a shampoo, and they're not saying that it does anything, right? They're like, <laughs> and then they're just selling it, and then like hopefully it, that pans out. And then like lastly, some of these companies, like MiniCircle and Lantern Bioworks, have started using Prospera as a way to Prove the concept, right? If you can at least show that some people are interested in it and are willing to like travel and spend money to use the treatment, then that's a sign to investors that this is worth uh, putting more money in to get regulatory approval in other jurisdictions. Okay, now that we've got all the past and present out of the way, we can dive into like the interesting part, uh, into the future. Uh, so first, though, some assumptions for a mature DSI ecosystem. Decentralized identity and reputation needs to become a thing. If it's, if it's not, then a lot of the cooler stuff probably won't happen. There have been these standards developed called verifiable claims and decentralized identity. Uh, there still hasn't been a ton of use of these things yet, but I'm hoping that uh, this could be like sort of the killer app that leads to them being adopted. Uh, verifiable claims are a, a way, like a standard for presenting information to somebody that uh, are, is cryptographically signed. And like the difference is like if you have an NFT, like anyone can see that you have that. It's like wearing a badge. But a verifiable claim is more like a passport where you show it to one person, they can see all these details, but nobody else sees those details. And so that's ex especially important for, say, drug dealers who want to be able to prove that they are a great drug dealer, but not necessarily want everybody to know that they're a great drug dealer. And then another assumption is that prediction markets will grow in volume. I think that those will be really helpful for uh, discovery. So uh, the general idea is that social media attention should naturally flow into the deployment of capital. So it's a, a conversion of social currency into cryptocurrency. Uh, I think we'll see multiple groups coordinate, coordinating around the same IP token. Uh, you could have Vita DAO and Athena DAO and whatever DAO. They all own a piece of this other token, and now they're all working together. They all share on the upside. I think we also need to see new types of permissive licenses, perhaps tied to smart contracts, that create royalty trees. Uh, so, for instance, uh, let's say that Alice releases her gene sequence and says, feel free to use this, but give me 10% of any commercialization. And then Bob releases a gene vector with a similar open license. And then Carol takes Alice and Bob's work, combines them, and then brings it to market. And now every time Carol's product makes a sale, some of that money could be forwarded to Alice and Bob through the use of royalty smart contracts in a way that's permissive, where it's like, it's not that you have to go to Alice and Bob to get the licensing deal, it's open. But they might come after you if you use it and don't pay her. So that's, that's kind of a, a model that I think reduces the timing of and like the money, the cost of, of just getting started. And, and I think that's the system will happen for music sampling, right? If it's like, if you're using my music and you use five seconds of it, give me a certain percentage, and then it potentially creates a whole hierarchy, though, if people are sampling each other. 
So if it can be used for music, why not also biotech? And then lastly, I think a mature DSI ecosystem for discovery would support autonomous agents that are able to perhaps collate papers and forum posts and then coordinate with groups to develop and commercialize a treatment. Future House is working on the, something along those lines. Uh, switching to evidence, I think uh, decentralized trials are currently really difficult. Be is, decentralized trials existed before crypto did, but they, they suffered because people sign up for it and then they don't follow through. And so you don't know how many people you need in your study. Uh, they, they just drop off. But back in 2020, I participated in a push-up challenge. Everybody put in 0.1 ETH, which at the time was $15. Everybody had to upload a video of themselves doing 20 push-ups on Telegram. If someone missed three sessions, they lost the 0.1 ETH. The other participants who completed it would get that 0.1 ETH, or that, a share of the loser's ETH. So effectively, I got paid for doing push-ups. I imagine a similar model could be used for motivating decentralized trials, so that way people actually follow through. And then as the reputation system matures, I could see that Participants that are review, like have good uh, credentials are able to sort of get early access to other trials because they want, you want a participant that's actually going to follow through. And then returning to the concept of composable research objects, I think that uh, a more robust way of indexing data sets together will allow us to make stronger claims without the need for someone to collate all the data manually for a meta-analysis. So if you have these kind of like different contra like uh, composable research objects linked together, you can then just start analyzing data that's related to each other without having to like go email them and say, hey, send me your data, and then I'm going to have to put it in a spreadsheet on my own. Like it's, it's, it's a nightmare to do a meta-analysis right now. OK, and this brings me to one of the two big ideas I hope to convey during this talk. The first one is an adversarial research group. As mentioned previously, both private and public sector scientists have incentives to produce research that confirms their hypotheses. What if an indie research group could make money regardless if they confirm or disprove the hypothesis? One way that this could happen is, is with prediction markets. These are, this is a manifold market, and these are all prediction markets about Lantern Bioworks' anti-cavity treatment, Lumina. So right now there's like a bunch of like different thoughts or threads, but the basic idea that is that if people bet like, will this treatment work? Will this treatment get approval? Uh, and a bunch of people are betting both for and against it. There is room for a research group to go test it on themselves. And then you take a position on the market. Like maybe it worked. So then you like vote yes. You put money behind yes. You release your data. If people trust your group as being an independent third party, then in theory, other people should follow along and then also vote yes. And then when the market gets resolved, that group gets a payout. And that's amazing because like normally, like you, you, you want one outcome. You don't want either outcome. So to be able to incentivize like truly independent research, I think could really change science. Um, of course, this could also be done without prediction markets by shorting or you know, going long on biotech companies. But this is kind of a problem with big biotech companies, with big pharma, because they own many treatments. So even if one of them fails, it may not necessarily tank their stock. But molecules work on tokenizing projects at the patent level could hopefully enable this sort of behavior that allows independent researchers to confirm or disprove uh, whether or not a product works. And, and lastly, distribution. The reality is that Bitcoin may have never have happened if it wasn't for the illicit drug trade. And so the question is, why not serve therapeutic drugs as well? If you've ever had the experience of trying to buy drugs online from someone, you've probably been scammed or at least felt like you're about to get scammed. Uh, and I think we can fix that. I think, I think, I think crypto can do this. And, and one of the best examples of this happening was a few years back there was a darknet site that was like the Silk Road, and it was taken down. And vendors from that site posted messages signed with their PGP key on Reddit about where they moved to. 
So that way, their customers that were going through that site are still able to find them. And they're using crypto to prove their identity. And it was very, a very lightweight solution, but still very effective. And so I think a lot about like, how do we scale that up? Um, and I think we'll eventually start seeing blockchains being used for supply chains as well. And that way, even if you don't necessarily have a huge amount of trust in that vendor, if you can see that the supply chain for the product goes up to a factory that people trust, uh, then that's a good sign that it's legitimate. And then uh, lastly, the composable research objects mean that an end consumer can make an informed decision based upon their own risk preferences rather than replying upon, relying upon the FDA's yes or no. Like, when the new treatment is out, like, the question is, like, how many people have to have done it first before you're willing to try it yourself? And if you're like in a serious health condition, maybe it's, it's zero or five people. But maybe if it's not, you want 5,000 people to have done it and not had any serious side effects. And I think that composable research objects are a way for data to be aggregating over time rather than just, uh, yes, it's approved or no, it's not approved. And so this takes me to like the second big idea that I hope to convey to you, which is an uh, alternative to the FDA and the patent system uh, using this sort of technology. And so can we bring treatments to the market responsibly without the need for top-down control? Can inventors or promoters of a treatment make money without relying upon the government's monopoly on violence? And so my assumption is that people pay 200% markup to know that they're putting a legitimate product in their bodies, right? Like, it's one thing to buy something off the internet, but if, you, if you're fairly certain that it's legitimate, you'll pay like a little bit extra, right? If you're gonna be injecting it anyways. So, in this system, the researchers, the influencers, the promoters, whoever, they're certifying production facilities. Production facilities certify distributors. As an end consumer, you can talk to that distributor and you can see the certification chain, you can see that it's valid, you can see that it's tied to this researcher that you trust, and make an informed decision based on that. And so this, gives, this makes a space for researchers, for influencers, to make money by, by instead of trying to extract rent, trying to extract royalties, it's more of like you're a steward for the supply chain. You're responsible for making sure that the producers and the distributors aren't scamming people because your reputation is on the line and the ability to make money from this product is also on the line. Taking it one step further, if you buy from one of these certified distributors, perhaps now you are a verified buyer and perhaps you could have permission to put your own personal data into the composable research object. And so now we can start collecting data from the first five people, the first 50 people, 500 people, instead of it just being like, we did a phase one, then we couldn't get enough money. If it can be an ongoing, rolling sort of data collection thing, I think that solves a lot of the problems regarding uh, clinical studies. Eventually, I think we'll see DAOs that sort of act as buyers clubs, where they test out a bunch of treatments, they make uh, a group buy on the best ones, and then generate more health data along the way. This seems like one of the few pathways forward for validating longevity treatments uh, because they're neglected by regulatory agencies and really, it's, most longevity enthusiasts are doing 10 or 15 different things anyways, so like trying to put them into a clinical study is, is, is hard. And, you, and to be able to follow them for the next 30, 40 years is just not practical. Um. So just kind of recapping, qualities of a mature DSI ecosystem. Hopefully the, bi the biotech valley of death has been bridged. There's not like a sudden drop off where like we didn't raise enough money for our phase two and now it's impossible to gain any traction again. Uh, if, as long as you can keep accumulating data, then you can hopefully make it to legitimacy. More accessible, we want non-institutional scientists even pseudonymous researchers, even autonomous agents contributing to the scientific process. I think these outsiders are necessary to challenge the conventional paradigms and really call the scientists on their bullshit. Uh, transparency, being able to check the data yourself uh, rather than it sort of being gated by the research company. Like they get to control, they only publish the positive results, they don't publish the negative results and I think that also kind of skews things. Um, safety. 
so, so a lot of people are concerned about access to biotech leading to people developing all sorts of terrible things, but I think that a culture of openness where anyone working in secret is by default regarded with suspicion is the healthiest antidote to that problem. And then combined with potentially faster development pathways, threats can be addressed uh, expediently. An example of this is that there was a COVID vaccine developed by biohackers in March or April of 2020. It seemed to maybe have worked, but they didn't have $100 million to develop it, so it just kind of went nowhere. But if this system scales up, then like if there was a new threat, then in theory we could roll out a treatment very quickly. And then ethically, if someone is producing a treatment and it's of high quality, it's, it's not ethical to send the police after them to stop, even if it is patented. Uh, so that's kind of a aside, but uh, okay, recapping, let's visit the problems of science and, and see how uh, DSI hopefully fixes this. Uh, so determining what is actually valuable, we need to be able to separate the signal from the noise, we need to be able to leverage reputation uh, to determine what gets capital and not just uh, the existing system of uh, uh, I, won't, I won't get into it, but okay. It's hard to build a company, but it's easy to start a DAO. And if there's more smart contracts for these permissive licensing, then it just becomes more feasible to very quickly like uh, get started testing something out instead of having to like wait for months and months to get a licensing deal. We can potentially circumvent the need for patents, period. Uh, the replication crisis can hopefully be solved by adversarial research groups that are trying to replicate and, and making money regardless if they do. Regulatory compliance, I think, honestly, is just best to sidestep things. Like I said, after 100 years, any institution has become corrupt, and uh, the FDA is not separate from that. Phase two and phase three costs can eventually be avoided if we have this kind of rolling model of data collection. Uh, using gray market websites is a way of getting global distribution without having to go through specific channels. And then if we start using certifications, verifiable claims for these gray market sites, then we have more trust in the process. And so just to recap the two big ideas, DSI can enable commercialization of research without the need for regulators or patents. And these adversarial research groups can hopefully uh, fix the replication crisis by uh, incentivizing uh, third parties. And limitations, of course, any system can be gamed. This is not perfect, but having reputation and identity can hopefully reduce the amount that people can go from scam to scam to scam because everybody knows that they are a scammer. Science is still a way of approximating truth. It is not the truth. And DSI and crypto in general is best for medium-sized trust problems, not necessarily small or huge ones. All right, and that, that concludes things. I'll be speaking again on Saturday about my experience running many circles, Polistat and gene therapy in Prospera. I'm particularly interested in meeting biotech companies while I'm here, but if any of this resonates with you, feel free to reach out. And lastly, if you're on Telegram, uh, you can use that QR code to join my biohacking group. And uh, that's, that's it. So I'll, yeah, yeah thank you.